Good morning and welcome to this, the second day of the Federalist Society National Lawyers Convention. I'm Dean Reuter, Vice President, General Counsel and Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. In store for you later today, we have a panel discussion on judicial association, with whom and under what, what condition judges can join or affiliate with what sorts of people or organizations and why knowing the details is important to practicing lawyers. We'll also learn more about the latest developments in regulating social media. We'll close today with an examination of a special form of litigation, multi-district litigation, which sometimes involves millions of people dispersed throughout the country and billions of dollars, all under the control of a single judge. But first, our free speech panel, moderated by Judge David Strauss. I've asked all the convention moderators to be very brief in their introductions, so I will do the same with Judge Strauss. He's been on the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals since January 2019, before which he was a Minnesota Supreme Court Justice for eight years, before which he was a professor at the University of Minnesota Law School, before which he clerked for Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, during all of which he's been a good friend. Judge David Strauss. Thank you, Dean, um, and thanks to everyone online who's uh, who's participating in the panel. We have a or online that are viewing the panel. We have a wonderful group of scholars today uh, to talk about the tiers of scrutiny and free speech. Um, I will, as Dean alluded to, uh, briefly uh, give the bio of each of our individual panelists and the order in which they will talk, uh, just so you know who's with us today and why you wanna listen to them. Our first speaker will be Genevieve Lakier who is an assistant professor of law and a teaching scholar at the University of Chicago Law School. She is both a lawyer and an anthropologist, having earned a PhD in anthropology. Her current research focuses on, among other things, the cultural history of the First Amendment. Our second speaker will be Nick Rosencrantz, who is a professor of law at Georgetown University Law Center, where he teaches con law and federal jurisdiction. He's a graduate of Yale Law School and a former clerk to Justice Kennedy. His research focuses primarily on constitutional interpretation and judicial review. Our third speaker will be Ash Bhagwat, who is a professor at the University of California Davis School of Law. He's a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School and a former clerk also to Justice Kennedy. He is a constitutional law scholar with an emphasis uh, which helps our panel today on First Amendment law. And our final speaker will be Eugene Volick, who's a distinguished professor of law at the UCLA School of Law. He's a graduate of UCLA and a former law clerk to Justice O'Connor. He's a member of the American Law Institute, a First Amendment scholar, and the founder and co-author of the popular blog, The Volick Conspiracy. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Genevieve, who is our first speaker of the day. All right, well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm thrilled to be on this panel. You know, uh, the tiers of scrutiny are part of the bread and butter of constitutional law. They're um, doctrinal frameworks that courts use every day when deciding constitutional cases, but they typically don't get their own spotlight. We don't think about them sort of in and of themselves. So um, thanks to Professor Volokh for organizing the panel. Uh, this is gonna be really fun. So the tiers of scrutiny are a modern invention. The idea that to determine whether a government action is constitutional, courts, or really anyone else for that matter, must look at the strength of the government's interest as well as the means it chooses to promote that interest. This idea would have been wholly foreign to 18th century thinkers. And certainly when we look at the 18th century discussion of the First Amendment and the various state constitutional guarantees of free expression, the assumption throughout these conversations about uh, these guarantees was that the rights they provided they were absolute. So it was widely assumed, for example, that what the First Amendment meant was that the government could impose no prior restraint on speech, no matter how good its justifications. And many thinkers, including perhaps most famously Alexander Hamilton, argued uh, that no liability could be imposed on libelous speech that was true and could be shown to have been published with good motives, even if, or especially if, the result was to cast the government into a highly negative light. Okay, so these are views of the First Amendment that did not require or imagine the necessity of imposing anything like the tiers of scrutiny we know today. Now, while there, have been, uh, while there may have been less absolutist discourses about some of the other federal constitutional rights, the history of which I know less about, 
There is no question that the tiers of scrutiny the courts employ today uh, and employ not only in First Amendment cases, but in many areas of constitutional law. These emerged only in the 1930s and 1940s, around the time of the New Deal constitutional revolution. And for the reason, those who embrace an originalist conception of constitutional meaning might want to reject the tiers of scrutiny as illegitimate exercises of judicial power. One might think, as Justice Douglas sometimes argued, that the tiers of scrutiny unnecessarily dilute the strength of the First Amendment's command by allowing courts to balance away our freedoms of speech and press and association. But that would be a mistake, I think. And to understand why, it is necessary to understand why the New Deal court essentially invented the tiers of scrutiny when it did. And it was not to limit the strength of First Amendment protection. Instead, it was a consequence of the court's embrace of a much more robust, much more counter-majoritarian, and much more constraining view of the First Amendment and the parallel state constitutional guarantees of free expression than courts had held previously. So the reason why the First Amendment protection could be construed in absolutist terms in the 18th and 19th centuries was because those protections were so limited. The government could be absolutely precluded from imposing prior restraints on speech because it had wide power to restrict speech after the fact. Um, and also because I think given the much more rural and less urbanized social conditions of the 18th and 19th centuries, the government had much less reason to engage in extensive licensing of public speech that municipalities all across the country engage in today, where they are constantly prior restraining speech in practice. And the First Amendment could similarly be interpreted to absolutely protect true defamatory speech that was published with good motives, because that construal of the law of libel in practice took off the table protection for true speech that undermined national security or that posed serious harm to government interests. That was considered speech that was published with bad, uh, uh, bad motives. And in general, jurists were able to rest on a relatively simple, doctrinally undeveloped, but absolutist view of freedom of speech and press, because the restrictions that those rights were understood to impose on the government were so weak, they were so limited, that no one really had to wrestle with the difficult question of how to reconcile the constitutional commitment to these freedoms with other important and perhaps constitutionally protected values like national security or public order or equality. In practice, those other values always trumped freedom of speech if not in theory. So it was only when Justice Holmes first announced a view of the First Amendment as imposing very significant constraints on the government, that uh, view of the First Amendment that prevented the government from being able to publish, uh, sorry, from being able to punish not only harmless speech as had previously been the case, but also even harmful or offensive speech. It was only at this point that the tears of scrutiny emerged in Holmes's insistence that exhortations and opinions, sort of political speech, core political speech, could be subject to criminal punishment because of its message only when it posed a clear and present danger of serious harm. And in this context, it becomes obvious that the idea of a non-absolutist First Amendment, which is essentially what Holmes was proposing, um, it emerged as a means of justifying the much more stringent protection of speech that Holmes and Brandeis wanted courts to read into it. It reflected the recognition that a robust theory of freedom of speech will inevitably create conflict, in some cases very serious conflict, with often with other very serious state and constitutional interests, and that a mechanism had to be found to reconcile those conflicts if this new robust counter-majoritarian regime of free speech protection was to prove sustainable. And this is the role that the tiers of scrutiny would continue to play more or less in First Amendment jurisprudence throughout the rest of the 20th century, and that they continue to play today. At least in theory, the tiers of scrutiny provide robust protection for expressive and associational autonomy without preventing the government from ever being able to regulate the harmful, disruptive, dirty, ugly, whatever it may be, effects of speech. By requiring there to be a connection between the ends the government announces for its actions and the means it adopts to achieve them, the tiers of scrutiny also, in theory at least, allow courts to smoke out hidden but invidious government purposes although I'm not sure always uh, terribly effectively. And finally, but very importantly, by forcing courts to engage in a context sensitive analysis of the effects of government action in the particular circumstances in which it acts. To ask, uh, not only as 19th century courts did, is this the kind of action that the government may undertake? Does this fall into the category of permitted or prohibited government actions? But to ask in these circumstances, does the government have a sufficiently compelling justification to engage in this action, given the consequences and the effects on the speakers it's going to be regulating? The tiers of scrutiny allow courts to embed into their constitutional analysis, consideration of the differing economic, social, and political circumstances of different kinds of speakers, to recognize that the same kinds of governmental actions may have more or less harmful effects, 
on the expressive freedom or the democratic um, uh, uh, values uh, that the First Amendment protects. So they produce, I think, on, on the whole, a more realist, more sociologically sensitive view of freedom of speech than would otherwise be true. And this is certainly uh, how Holmes viewed uh, the clear and present danger standard. These are all very important virtues of the tiers of scrutiny, virtues that would be lost were we to embrace a more absolutist model of the First Amendment. And in general, it is for me almost impossible to imagine an absolutist view of the First Amendment that was also not much narrow in its scope and much weaker in its force. This is because courts are going to be unwilling to allow speech interests to trump all other interests. Now, again, to go back to the sort of question about originalism, you know, a much weaker First Amendment would be more in keeping with original understandings of the meaning of freedom of speech and press. But in a world in which we understand the tremendous power that the government has to muzzle speech by the threat of ex post sanctions, uh, it is not an attractive vision or one I think we are and the courts are likely to return to anytime soon. Now, none of, this, none of this is to say that the tiers of scrutiny in the form they currently take are perfect. Um, I don't wanna take up too much time, so I'm not gonna say much about this, although I hope we talk more about this in the conversation. But in their current form, the, the, um, the form of means and balancing, the tier of scrutiny the courts employ in their um, content neutral cases. So for example, in the incidental regulations of speech cases or the time, place and manner cases, they're much too deferential, I think, to government interests. And an argument could be made conversely that strict scrutiny in its current form is just too strict. But these are details. The point is that the tiers of scrutiny provide an important mechanism by which courts reconcile on the one hand strong protection for freedom of speech and press with other values and therefore preserve judicial commitment to a strong and counter-majoritarian strong and counter-majoritarian First Amendment. Were we to reject the tiers, it's not at all obvious what other mechanism would be available to perform that important and I think even perhaps foundational uh, task. Okay, so that's all I'll say for now. I hand it over to Professor Rosencrantz. Uh, thank you. So I'm delighted to be with you all, if only virtually. And uh, thank you, Genevieve, for getting the um, status quo on the table. I think my role here is to be a bit skeptical of tiers of scrutiny and um, to at least sketch an alternative approach or at least hint at one. Uh, for many in this audience, the reasons for skepticism uh, are obvious and Genevieve actually um, hinted at several of them. First, obviously, they're entirely a textual, so there's no hint of them in the um, text of the Constitution. Now, that's obviously true of many or most lines of doctrine, but at least many lines of doctrine plausibly actualize um, uh, the constitutional text. Tears of scrutiny seem to be a particularly poor fit for the absolute sounding language of the First Amendment. Second, the tiers of scrutiny are essentially elaborate balancing tests and the nature of this balance, particularly the assessment of the importance of the government interest seems paradigmatically legislative. And while it's true that there are for better or worse, many such balancing tests in constitutional law, again, this seems a poor fit for the absolutist sounding uh, text. Third, uh, the tiers of scrutiny don't seem to resolve uh, some of the hardest doctrinal puzzles, strains of doctrine like overbreadth and uh, to maybe the O'Brien test and things pose some riddles that are uh, kind of orthogonal to tiers of scrutiny. So they don't necessarily solve a lot of, um, there are at least several problems that they don't seem to solve. And um, Fourth, it is uh, you know, perhaps tempting to say that they're simply essential for structuring this judicial inquiry, impossible to craft doctrine without them. You know, but as Genevieve says, they are a relatively recent invention. And so I think that alone should make us a bit skeptical of the sort of concern that, they're, um, that we couldn't possibly survive without them. But um, so with the balance of my time, I just want to begin to sketch what a uh, First Amendment world might look like um, if the doctrine were reoriented toward uh, constitutional text. I want to suggest, first, that the results aren't as radical as they might appear. Um, second, that uh, that's actually solve some doctrinal riddles that tiers of scrutiny don't. And third, I want to suggest some surprising doctrinal harmonies that emerge when we take the text uh, seriously, both within the First Amendment and more broadly throughout the Constitution. So just a general point first, 
we're in the habit of saying uh, this statute violates the Constitution. I insist that that's not quite right. That's um, a sort of pathetic fallacy along the lines of this gun committed murder. Uh, statutes don't violate the Constitution. Um, government actors do. Uh, the Constitution forbids government actors from doing certain things. And so I claim that before we get to the how question, how was the Constitution allegedly violated, we have to answer the logically prior uh, who question. So who allegedly uh, violated it? And I claim that just asking these questions in uh, and taking the answer seriously will um, properly structure First Amendment judicial review. So, um, uh, you know, I begin with what is a, really a pretty obvious point. Take, for example, the uh, Sedition Act. So in 1798, Congress makes it a crime to write, print, utter, or publish any false, scandalous, malicious writing, writings against the government of the United States, etc. Uh, my simple point here is, okay, so we're accustomed to say that the Sedition Act, uh, that there's a um, First Amendment violation here. Um, my simple point here is, who has violated the Constitution in this case? I insist the answer must be Congress. Uh, this is the sort of insight that is considered uh, radical in the academy, uh, but utterly commonsensical out in the world. They're shocked that you can get tenure for an insight like this. The language says Congress shall make no law. I claim therefore that the amendment is about Congress. So Congress shall make no law. I claim the answer to the who question has to be Congress in the First Amendment context. And that the when question uh, follows. So when was the constitution violated? If the answer to the who question is Congress, the answer to the when question has to be when Congress made the law. So uh, in this case, the Sedition Act Congress made in Jul on July 4th, 14th, 1798, that is the day of the constitutional violation. But consider what follows if you take that uh, seriously. Um, that implies that um, the facts of the violation can't quite matter. A challenge has to be facial in the sense that it has to be about the face of the statute for the simple reason that any enforcement facts happen after the violation of the Constitution is already complete, after Congress has already done the bad thing. So, you know, if you were prosecuted pursuant to the Sedition Act, your what exactly you said would matter to the prosecution trying to prove its case, but it wouldn't matter at all to your constitutional defense. Your constitutional defense would just require putting the text of the statute next to the text of the First Amendment. And uh, Thomas Jefferson understands this, which is why his Kentucky resolution declares this act of Congress to be, quote, altogether void and of no force and why he later pardons everyone convicted under the Sedition Act, regardless of what they had written. So even though some of the speech perhaps could have been um, punished under some other law, it can't be public, punished under this law. And that's the important thing, orients our attention toward the uh, law rather than toward the speech. It's a bit confusing to talk about um, protected and unprotected speech, we should really talk about um, problematic and non-problematic non uh, laws. Uh, so that's the um, Sedition Act. Consider um, the, uh, so consider, for example, the, um, uh, the, um, the uh, O'Brien test and the question of um, uh, laws which are on their face neutral as to um, speech, but which might sweep up some speech-related conduct. Um, There's a bit of a puzzle for the uh, tiers of scrutiny, but once you take the who and the when seriously, it becomes an easy case, right? Because the statute is, uh, but because the violation of the Constitution is the enacting of the statute, the doctrinal test has to be one that a congressman could conceivably apply. Uh, ex ante, and looking at the text of the statute. And a statute that is speech neutral 
has to be uh, constitutional or else every statute would fail, right? Because every action could be taken with a speech purpose in theory. Uh, and that uh, um, answers our O'Brien question and actually shows us the relationship between a case like O'Brien and a case like Employment Division v. Smith. So just as a religion neutral law is okay under the free exercise clause, perhaps a speech neutral law is permissible under the, for, under the uh, free speech clause. Um, I have tons more to say, but I'm required to stop there. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna turn it over now to Ash Bhagwat. Thank you very much. Um, I am gonna speak briefly about a couple of aspects of the tiers of scrutiny that um, I think suggest that the modern absolutism is less true than sort of is portrayed. The Supreme Court today, it seems to me, especially Justice Thomas in a case like NIFLA, seems to be on a campaign to sort of have the tiers of scrutiny approach Content neutral laws get intermediate scrutiny, content based laws get strict scrutiny, spread it across the terrain of First Amendment law. And for two separate reasons, I think that is very unlikely to be successful. One is it doesn't really work. There are still corners of First Amendment law, important corners, where tiers of scrutiny really don't make a whole lot of sense. And I want to, most obvious example is situations where free speech law intersects with tort law most famously libel in New York Times versus Sullivan, but also the IEED tort in Snyder versus Phelps. This is the Westboro Baptist Church case um, and the privacy cases from the 70s and 80s. In all of those cases, the difficulty becomes what the court actually focuses on is not the strength of the governmental interest at all. It focuses purely on whether or not the speech is on a matter of public concern or newsworthy. And that suggests something important, which is, is there are situations when we are not willing to ba balance away First Amendment rights. Um, frankly, in, in contexts such as privacy, where the claim, the government interest in protecting victims is actually quite strong. Um, so the idea that we're going to be able to resolve all difficult issues by balancing speech and um, the, right, the interest in speech with government interest strikes me as being problematic. Um, and I think other things that the court has been trying to not focus on, such as how, I mean, is the, how important is the speech from the point of view of maintaining democratic self-governance, are going to become important because it seems to me, for example, in a privacy case, that that's a very important factor. The second problem and more fundamental problem I have with tiers of scrutiny, and it really, it reflects something that Nick said earlier, but I wanna focus on it, is that the tiers of scrutiny approach requires the government to decide, sorry, requires the courts to decide how important a governmental interest is. Is it compelling? Is it substantial or important? Is it legitimate? I don't think the courts have any mechanism for making these judgments, and I don't think they ever have. The idea really stems from Korematsu, in 1944, where the court upholds the Japanese internment, at least in part because of the very strong American interest in winning the war, that should immediately give pause because Korematsu is of course a terrible decision. Um, and afterwards you look especially at the First Amendment area and the court does not tend to really, have, it's never really articulated to my mind any good theory for how to assess whether or not a government interest is compelling. Um, and I'm not sure how they could because it strikes me as being a quintessentially legislative judgment. Um, so typically the way the court, to give a sort of prime example, the court has regularly over the years can said that, this, that the government has a compelling interest in protecting children from being exposed to sexually explicit materials. It then almost always goes ahead and strikes down the law on narrow tailoring grounds. But that frankly strikes me as being problematic for reasons that I think Professor Follick is gonna talk about. But I start with the question, well, why? Why is that a compelling interest? There's no empirical evidence that children are harmed by exposure to sexually explicit materials. Frankly, if anything, there's more empirical evidence that children are harmed by exposure to violent materials. Yet in Brown versus Entertainment Merchants Association, the court did not accept that as a sufficient interest to justify strike upholding a law. Um, and I, the answer seems to be some sort of historical understanding, but that's very odd because the word compelling interest suggests some sort of an objective 
understand it. Um, so, excuse me, half a sec. My apologies, the difficulties with being at home. Um, so my basic contention is, is that the tiers of scrutiny approach is not gonna work for in, very, for in the area of strict scrutiny. I think in the area of intermediate scrutiny, where effectively we're doing free form balancing, it does work. Though perhaps as Genevieve said, it's more too differential to the government, but I don't see a long-term approach where strict scrutiny becomes a plausible form of analysis simply because the decision of what is a strong enough governmental interest to be able to overturn what we recognize as a fundamental right is not something that I think the courts are ever going to be able to come up with a coherent theory on. Um, and so I think we are left with how else do we decide when the government should be able to overturn a fundamental right? Um, and I think that's a question we haven't really started to answer. The reality is, if you look at the actual strict scrutiny cases in the area of the First Amendment during the modern era, there are only two cases in which an unequivocal, fairly unequivocal majority of the court has found that the law survives strict scrutiny. One is Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project. That is upholding the Material Support to Foreign Terrorists um, Act. The court deferred to the government. On the, on the existence of a compelling interest. That's not real strict scrutiny, that's national security and that's different. The other case, the williams Uli case, involves a bar on judicial ca candidates for judicial office um, requesting personally requesting campaign donations. That is perhaps the most bizarre strict scrutiny case ever because the court never, as the dissent correctly points out, the court struggled to even identify what exactly the compelling interest was. So I think my own view is, is, is that if we think that content-based laws should sometimes survive scrutiny, the compelling interest test is never gonna give us a good way of determining when that should be so. And we might, I think we need to come up with other ways of figuring that out. I have thoughts in that regard, but I'm gonna stop here and leave that for the Q&A session. I'm gonna pass it on to Eugene Volick. Thank you very much. Um, so I agree with, with much that everybody has said, almost everything that everybody has said. Um, I agree that, uh, uh, that some kind of uh, uh, escape hatch for the government uh, uh, is necessary, uh, especially once you start rest, uh, uh, striking down content neutral speech restrictions. Uh, that it's hard to imagine an absolute rule that says you can't have uh, uh, volume restrictions in residential neighborhoods at night, let's say. Uh, if, you're, if you're going to have parades on city streets, well, people use city streets usually for other things, you're going to need to have some kind of content neutral speech restrictions. Something needs to be done. Um, at the same time, uh, I, I, I entirely agree with, uh, with Professor Bhagwat that this is, uh, that what has been done is, uh, Actually, I'm sorry, you know, maybe we should, if, if I might suggest, use first names. I think we all know each other. If not, we'll know each other afterwards. I certainly know all of you. So I entirely agree with Ash that this is, uh, uh, that this is um, uh, a, uh, 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 that the existing scheme doesn't really work very well. But, and let's look a little bit at why. Uh, by, by before we figure out why uh, it doesn't work that well, we need to figure out what it means. So heightened scrutiny. Strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny. How does the court define that? Well, it says that content-based speech restrictions must be narrowly tailored to serve a compelling interest. Content neutral restrictions, so long as they leave open ample alternative channels, must be narrowly tailored to serve a significant governmental interest. And the inclusion or omission of governmental doesn't really matter. Uh, it just varies from case to case. So it sounds like the real difference is in the magnitude of the interest. It turns out not to be so. And in fact, uh, uh, there are very few cases where the court has even suggested uh, that, some in, that, that what's doing the work is that some interest is significant but not compelling. There's no doubt that strict scrutiny is very demanding. There's no doubt that intermediate scrutiny is quite forgiving, but the language of the test doesn't really tell us much. How about uh, in, um, uh, restrictions on commercial speech, non-misleading commercial speech? I oversimplified here, but basically that. Well, the court has said 
that those restrictions must directly advance a substantial government interest that could not be served as well by a more limited restriction. And in various cases, the court has suggested that that's just an elaboration on intermediate scrutiny. It's pretty similar to content neutral restrictions. Although it turns out that at least in recent years, this test has been extremely demanding, not quite as demanding as strict scrutiny, but close to it. Even though earlier the court had said, well, in many ways, it's pretty similar to intermediate scrutiny for content neutral restrictions. And indeed, it's not like there's any daylight between substantial and significant. What about restrictions on disclosure? Uh, excuse me, restriction mandates that one discloses certain um, uh, campaign spending. Those, the court has said, are subject to exacting scrutiny. They must bear a substantial relation to a sufficiently important governmental interest. Well, all right, that sounds like it's less demanding than intermediate scrutiny for content neutral restrictions, because note, uh, important and significant sound pretty similar, but substantial relations seems less demanding than early tailored. Yet many people say, and I think this some measure reflects the way the court has approached this, that it's actually in between intermediates and, and, and strict scrutiny, but where exactly we don't know. So the language of those, uh, of those tests is, I think, singularly unhelpful, kind of in the way the lemon test back in the day was unhelpful. Now, of course, some cases can elaborate on that. Well, what do they say? What, what does narrowly tailored mean, for example? Well, it means the restriction must substantially advance the interest. So sometimes the court says, you know, it's really very speculative that this law would even advance the interest. So it means it sacrifices speech for no really good reason. It must not be over-inclusive. So at the very least, that means that you can't draw a law that's that, that, is, that just covers less speech. Uh, but uh, still serves the interest just as well. So, the, uh, so an example that the court has given, and for example, in McCullen v. Coakley, uh, which struck down 36-foot uh, uh, buffer zones around abortion clinics, it said, look, if you want to restrict, uh, um, uh, 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 let's say, uh, trespassing uh, or blocking entrances, you can do that through a law that's focused on that. But the speech outside those entrances doesn't um, uh, 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 doesn't advance the interest. The law as a whole advances it because in the process of creating the bubble zone, it also prevents trespassing and blocking. Uh, but it could be made, could be written to cover less activity and not include this kind of speech. Um, a related thing is the restriction must be the least restrictive means. So there can't be any alternative that does the job as well. So a classic example of that was a case called Sable Communications, where the court struck down a total ban on dial a -porn. Remember that? When, when people thought that the way people would get pornography is through the telephone? I guess in a sense they still do under certain definitions of telephone. In any event, there, was a, uh, there were restrictions on dial porn aimed at, uh, there was a ban on dial porn aimed at shielding children. The court said, uh, and as Ash points out, maybe it was right, maybe it was wrong, but the court said that it, was, that it served a compelling government interest, but said there's a less restrictive means. You could have credit card screening or you could have uh, subscriber level blocking through which parents could uh, shield their children uh, from, uh, uh, from this kind of dialogue. Um, so uh, the, the first three are closely related because in a sense you could, you could fold both one and two into three. Anything that doesn't substantially advance the interest isn't the least restrictive means likewise with over-inclusiveness. Um, uh, so sometimes this is articulated as they've gotta be necessary to serve a, com a compelling interest. And it must not be under-inclusive. So that says that if a law fails to restrict certain kinds of speech that affects the interest pretty much as much, that's a sign that there's impermissible content discrimination. That's a sign the government itself might not be viewing the interest as compelling. Classic example, there's an Osnick v. City of Jacksonville in 1975. There was a ban on um, uh, the display of nudity on drive-in theater screens that are visible from the street. And the court said there isn't really a substantial enough interest in shielding people from offensive material. The law is over-inclusive with regard to the interest in shielding children from sexually explicit material because it doesn't cover just sexually explicit nudity. But what about traffic? There you are driving along and there's this giant naked person moving in vivid color on the screen. Wasn't that something that might distract people? Ah, the court says, but this is under-inclusive. What about car chases? What about explosions? What about various other things? 
It's an interesting question whether the law should be struck down on those grounds. After all, you might say better a, a lesser restriction, restriction than a greater one. Uh, in fact, maybe the under-inclusiveness made the law more narrowly tailored because it didn't affect as much. Also, you might say, you know, hard to prove this, but maybe nudity is more distracting than a car chase. In any event, that would, that's a very important element. Now, what's the real difference between intermediate scrutiny of content-neutral restrictions and strict scrutiny of content-based restrictions? It turns out that elements three and four are replaced for intermediate scrutiny with a reasonable fit requirement. Formally, the distinction between the tests is in the substantiality of the interest. Both tests are articulated as being about narrow tailoring, but the narrow tailoring for, for uh, content-neutral restrictions is actually different, defined differently than for content-based restrictions. At the very least, I think poor judicial craftsmanship, although it's sort of evolved this way over the years, and result is pretty confusing for, for litigators and their opponents. So let me suggest that, that there are some key questions that remain besides the ones that Ash identified, or in addition to them. One is how demanding is the under-inclusiveness inquiry? So uh, um, you mentioned two cases, Holder v. Humanitarian Law Project and Williams U. Lee versus Florida Bar, and they upheld speech restrictions under strict scrutiny by essentially ignoring the under-inclusiveness inquiry as a practical matter. Whereas some cases like Osnaznik, and there are several others I could point to, that are really all about under-inclusiveness. So it looks like whether a law is going to be struck down or not isn't entirely defined, but is often defined by whether Courts apply a version of strict scrutiny which under inclusiveness has a lot of teeth versus one in which it's a lot more gummy. A second cat, uh, set of questions has to do with question whether there's some categorical prohibitions, whether there are some situations in which the court essentially would say, doesn't matter how necessary the law is to compelling government interest, it's just impermissible. You might say necessary and proper this is a loose analogy, but you might say, well, some laws may be necessary, even in a strict, super strict, non-McCulloch sense of necessary, that, that any, uh, that striking down the law would interfere with the, with the serving of the compelling government interest, but it's just not proper, it's just not permissible. So for example, um, there are some situations, for, in the, for instance, in Holder v. Humanitarian Law Project, uh, where the court seems to suggest that if a restriction is too substantial, it's forbidden even when necessary to serve a compelling interest. It's not that it's over-inclusive. It's not that it covers speech that fails to serve the interest. It just covers speech in a way that too much interferes with democracy. So Holder said it's okay to impose a content-based restriction on speech essentially too um, uh, uh, foreign terrorist organizations, speech that's coordinated with foreign terrorist organizations, because that uh, uh, that's necessary to uh, pr help prevent terrorism. But what about an op-ed in the New York Times saying this organization that we call terrorists are actually freedom fighters, we should, we should all support them. That may help that organization, which may be genuinely terrorist, much, much more than some coordinated communication. But the court suggested in Holder well, that, that that would not be permissive. What about viewpoint-based restrictions? There are two restrictions, uh, or two cases in recent years where the court said essentially that viewpoint-based restrictions are categorically unconstitutional. It doesn't matter if they pass strict scrutiny. That's a perfectly plausible test, and I like that kind of approach. Setting up just a rule, say viewpoint-based, unconstitutional. There's some vagueness as to what's viewpoint-based, but you can imagine that without uh, uh, then going into this quite underdetermined analysis. Uh, uh, but, uh, but the court has in the past, I think, uh, evaluated some kind of viewpoint-based restrictions on uh, under strict scrutiny, although it struck them down. And uh, uh, it's, uh, the, those cases didn't have real occasion to grapple with the issue. What about restrictions that aim to achieve effects by preventing people from being persuaded? which is to say, let's take a, co a commercial speech restriction. Let's say that uh, uh, the law would ban advertising of, uh, um, of uh, gasoline burning cars because that would encourage people to buy those cars, which would increase consumption of gasoline, increase greenhouse gases, let's say. Uh, would that be constitutional? Recent cases, recent commercial speech cases, and some old ones too, unlike some that were kind of in between, um, seem to say that's just not permissible. It doesn't matter how practically effective a means that is of uh, achieving the government interest. It's just an impermissible form of tailoring. Again, I think that's a, that, that's a good kind of rule. And there are some other cases which you can talk about during Q&A that support that. But it's not something that's at all visible on the text of the text. 
And another question that arises, uh, and it arose in Holder, the foreign terrorist organization case, and in Brown, which Ash mentioned, uh, Brown the Entertainment Merchants, which is the violent video game case, is how much should judges defer to government empir empirical judgments? And those cases reached quite different results, uh, answers to that question. And again, that's not something that's clearly visible on the surface of the scrutiny tests, uh, uh, but ends up being really important. So to summarize, I think there needs to be some means of figuring out when restrictions are constitutional. Uh, I prefer trying to use a more categorical approach, like the court historically has said as to libel, incitement, and such. But I don't know if that would work, for instance, for intermediate scrutiny or for other kinds of things. Uh, that is say for content neutral restrictions. But uh, if we are going to stick with this, I think that it would be better to go back over it if the court is willing to do that, which the court so rarely does, and ask what is really going on there? Because the current formulations uh, of the tests are not real, don't really explain what's really going on. They're poor guidance for lower courts, they're poor guidance for uh, litigators, and they're poor guidance for the regulated government officials. Uh, that is to say, the government officials whose government action, as Nick points out, the First Amendment is trying to restrain. So with that, I turn things back over to, uh, to, to Judge, uh, Judge Strasse, uh, who will start a conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks to everybody. This is fascinating. Uh, I'll sort of end where uh, Eugene, uh, or start where Eugene ended, which is to say that um, he's absolutely right when he says this is a really tough tough area of law for judges to navigate. I mean, the fact of the matter is there's so many, with even beyond the tiers of scrutiny, there's so many subcategories of issues within those cases that, you know, suffice it to say, I learned a little bit about how everything fits together. So I thank each of you uh, for, uh, for your remarks. They were excellent. Um, before we turn it over to audience questions, I want to give folks on the panel a chance to respond to each other. And Genevieve, I know you had a couple of comments you wanted to make, and I'll give each of you a chance to, you know, either ask a question of someone else or give a couple of remarks in response to your co-panelists. So Genevieve, you first. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so yeah, these, these questions I think are primarily for Ash and Eugene, but Nick, feel free to chime in too, because just listening to the, the comments made me think that there are actually two different questions on the table here, and I don't wanna mix them up. They're both very useful and interesting questions. One is, are the, is the current application of, of the tiers of scrutiny faulty in some way? Eugene suggested, you know, it's very non-obvious what these tests mean. And I know this because when I teach free speech, I'm teaching freedom, I'm teaching the First Amendment speech clause right now. Whenever I go over the O'Brien test and the, the intermediate scrutiny test, there has to be like a debriefing for the students so that they actually know what these mean because it's absolutely, Eugene's right, it's not obvious from the text. And so there is a good question about sort of transparency and, and also what is going on there. So my view about why there is this poor fit between what the words on the page say and how courts apply them is that the tiers of scrutiny uh, emerge, uh, have a sort of deep history in First Amendment law, um, but have been distorted, transformed, reshaped by a much more recent addition to the, the jurisprudence, which is the distinction between content-based and content-neutral um, speech regulation, which is overpowering everything. <laughs> and so uh, tiers of scrutiny tests for what a, the court thinks are content neutral regulations um, uh, have become more deferential over time and less uh, restrictive of the government. And tiers of scrutiny tests like for the commercial, in the commercial speech cases that are dealing with content based regulations have become more like strict scrutiny. And so there's a way in which we might be seeing the transformation, the evolution of the tiers of scrutiny there, you know, in the early and mid 20th century, I think the court was very sensitive to the problem that the government might overregulate or might significantly um, limit the expressive opportunities of groups, even when it had a content neutral purpose, even when it wasn't trying to actually go after speech because of a specific part of its content, the effect might nevertheless be very pernicious on these expressive activities of certain groups or just in the context in which it applied, it might be bad. And so it was relatively rigorous when it applied a content neutral, the intermediate uh, standard of scrutiny. Um, and in recent decades, I think the court has turned away from that. Really, I think what the court uh, thinks it's doing in most of these cases is looking at the legitimacy of the government's purposes. And I think that's a mistake because I think that we really should, you know, it's very easy and cheap to regulate speech. The government internalizes all the costs of um, speech, but it doesn't internalize the tremendous social benefits. And so um, I think that there is a, 
I agree with Eugene that there's all kinds of problems with the current tests in part that are um, um, evident by, but maybe not caused by the non-transparency of the language. But that seems to me just qualitatively different kind of question from do we need the tiers of scrutiny at all? The fact that right now they're not operating the same way they did maybe 50 years ago, and therefore they're quite difficult for courts to apply and they're achieving results that maybe uh, we may not like in every instance. That's a reformist project. We might say, well, we're just getting it wrong. <laughs> we should bite the bullet and say it's strict scrutiny in commercial speech cases. We should think again about how we deal with content neutral cases, but that's all within the realm of uh, the tiers of scrutiny. Unless there's some reason to think that this is sort of an inevitable feature of the, the approach. And then the second question that we've been talking about is, are there, is there, are there reasonable alternatives? And Ash, actually you suggested two, I thought, which was really interesting. I mean, we could have a, we could, the primary distinction could be high value, low value speech, because in all the cases that you were talking about in which we don't really apply the tiers of scrutiny, those are all cases involving low value speech, really, um, in which courts feel free to apply different kinds of rules. But for those who are worried about judges making it up, I don't think we should feel great about uh, jurisprudence organized around high value, low value speech, because you know what you see in low value speech cases is just really free judicial balancing. I mean, think about the libel cases. The court's just doing a first order. It's just balancing privacy interests and reputational interests against government interests. And it's creating this like complex typology of public officials and public figures and semi uh, limited public uh, figures and private figures. And then a speech that doesn't touch on matters of public concern, it's just freely balancing. But it, the only reason it feels empowered to freely balance is because we're in low value speech land. And the turn to that alternative, like it triggers all the concerns I talked about at the beginning about how if we move away from the tiers of scrutiny, we're gonna in, in some ways have a narrower first amendment. There's gonna be more pressure to find more categories of speech that are low value. And therefore the first amendment applies with full force in a narrow, a narrow bunch of cases. And then of course we could have just a simple distinction between content-based and content neutral regulation of speech, which I think is actually where the court is heading. But that worries me tremendously because I think the government can do a tremendous amount of damage when it's regulating speech in a content neutral fashion. And I wouldn't wanna just say content neutral regulations trigger no first amendment scrutiny. At the same time, I think there are all kinds of content based regulations that can be justified for when they serve important privacy interests. I'm thinking about say, for example, the professional speech cases, which are often involve content based restrictions and what professional uh, doctors and lawyers can say, those seem to me very important. And so a much, a much more absolutist approach, which you know, says government may never engage in content based regulation of speech, but may always engage in content neutral regulation of speech. Uh, Judge Stress, it'd be much easier for you to apply, uh, but I think it would be, there would be all, it would be both um, overly restrictive of the government in some cases and unbelievably restrictive in others. Responses. Sure, let me take a shot. So I, so I, mean, I don't think you and I disagree all that much, unsurprisingly. Um, when I think of tiers of scrutiny in the First Amendment area, I think of it as intimately tied to the content-based, content-neutral distinction simply because it has been for 50 years, right? Mosley versus Chicago Police Department is early 1970s. That's a quarter, it's a half a century now. Um, so I, when I talked about tiers of scrutiny, I was also just associating that with content-based, content-neutral. And I completely agree with you. I think that is not an adequate tool around which to organize First Amendment law because as I was saying, there are many areas where content discrimination makes perfect sense. For example, in the area of professional speech, as you said, where it's utterly insane to say we can't punish doctors for malpractice because that's a content-based restriction on speech, or let's be better, lawyers. Um, and that's just nutty, right? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Um, and yet that seems to be where Justice Thomas was heading in the NIFLA case, which is crazy. Um, and we're, not, we're never going to go there. We're not going to overturn 200 years of common law because the Supreme Court has, you know, adopted a sort of an abstract idea that doesn't really fit. I am just suggesting, and I know you disagree with me on this, that the tiers of scrutiny approach doesn't really tell us when content-based discrimination is or is not a good idea. Um, that's, and I think there you may agree with me. Um, and for example, I think there are several Supreme Court cases which say that laws which prefer political speech to commercial speech are unconstitutional. The Reed versus Town of Gilbert case and the Discovery Network case, I think that's crazy. 
I think that if we actually think about why we have a First Amendment, it's not that I would not protect commercial speech, I probably would, but the idea that political speech and, and commercial speech are equally important to the social values underlying the First Amendment simply makes no sense to me. And I think that was the point I was trying to make. So I'll leave it there. Uh, Other responses, go ahead. Judge, could I chime in before Nick, just because I have a, my question is in large measure for Nick and then he could respond. Sure, no problem, absolutely. So, so first let me say one thing that I like in the First Amendment area is the relatively categorical tests. So for example, the libel law uh, rules, one can question whether they're sound, but they do set up, uh, set up guidelines that I think lower courts routinely enforce. I mean, there are thousands of such cases every year, probably at the various uh, levels of, of uh, American courts. Um, so they routinely enforce them. They have a pretty decent sense usually of, of uh, how they apply. There are sometimes questions about who's a public figure and who's not, but usually there emerges a good deal of case law in the jurisdiction on the subject, for example. So there are certainly flaws with it, but I like that approach a lot better than, than having uh, libel law cases turn each one on uh, how you apply strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny for that matter. So I think that there are real pluses to that kind of approach. But, but, uh, but then the question, as Nick points out, is what do you apply that to? You can have, you can imagine a categorical approach that's applied entirely at the face of the statute. So I'm not sure Nick would say that, but you might say the original meaning of the freedom of the press seemed to exclude libel, even in, in state constitutions, maybe the federal constitution was only meant as to Congress, but state constitutions talked about liberty of the press as well. Everybody understood that some sort of libel litigation is permissible, uh, but uh, so, so maybe we have categorical rules as to that, but only on the face of the statute. So what I wanna ask Nick about though, is what happens with regard to many statutes, which are on their face speech neutral, but can punish speech because of the persuasive or offensive or other such power of the speech. So one classic example were the World War I era uh, Espionage Act in, uh, uh, cases uh, where uh, uh, the, um, uh, 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 where the, the, uh, uh, so the Schenck and Debs really, uh, and, and Fro work and some others as well, where the law on its face essentially said that it's a crime to interfere with recruit uh, for the military. Uh, and uh, it had lots of permissible applications. If you change yourself to the draft office, uh, you'd be committing that crime. If you bond the draft office, you'd be committing the crime. Uh, but also if you said things that encouraged people not to show up for, uh, uh, for the draft, not to register for the draft, not, not to go fight, you'd also be committing the crime under the text of the statute. So you might say, therefore, that it's just constitutional because the law on its face doesn't even mention speech. Uh, you know, I think uh, uh, um, some such laws sometimes do mention it in passing as one of the things that's restricted, but you could certainly imagine a version of the law that doesn't mention speech at all. Or uh, let's say, for example, somebody is prosecuted for engaging in racist speech in a place where it might lead to violence. Not, not doesn't fit Brandenburg, does not solicitation, just might lead to violence. He's prosecuted for disturbing the peace. And disturbing the peace statutes often are written in speech neutral ways. They can certainly be written in speech neutral ways. They focus on effect, they may focus on intent, but they don't focus on the means. They equally apply uh, to disturbing the peace by throwing rocks, disturbing the peace through fighting words, uh, disturbing the peace through political advocacy and the like. Cohen v. California uh, uh, the, uh, uh, involved not a general prohibition on vulgarities uh, or, uh, or specific prohibition of vulgarities, it involved a breach of the peace law. So there are lots of such laws out there. Holder v. Humanitarian Project is actually another example, and it's the case that most clearly talked about this and said that a law that is facially speech neutral is still treated as a speech restriction if it's being applied to speech because of its content. I think that's a wise approach, whether the consequence of that is to, tr is to uh, apply strict scrutiny or not, or, or perhaps to use some more categorical approach as a separate matter. Uh, but it sounded to me like under Nick's proposal, any such law would be constitutional. So the government could, for example, by banning conduct that yield, that leads to race discrimination, also punish 
speech that supports race discrimination, pro-race discrimination speech. Uh, would that be sound? Uh, thanks, Eugene. Um, I, I have um, the luxury as a textualist academic of saying that uh, if the results are of the theory are bad, I don't care, right? I don't, um, so Eugene, you can, uh, you can name lots of examples that will perhaps make me uncomfortable with their results, but I'm just not in that business. I'm trying to come up with the best uh, reading of the constitution. And if the results are unsatisfying, we should amend it. But if that's what the text requires, it requires. I can at least, I'm allowed to take that position as an academic uh, espousing a theory. Um, not so easy as a judge, obviously. Um, that said though, I'm not sure that there are such, uh, that all the results are so crazy. So. As you point out, uh, viewpoint-based is basically categorical as is. The court says that it's categorical. Content-based is virtually categorical, right? There are very few cases that seem to um, come out the other way. And you know, I think we could say the judicial candidate solicitation case just comes out wrong. And Holder View Humanitarian Law Project, as you point out, is maybe better analyzed as a uh, as a speech neutral law, and you're right, it would be in the sort of Shank Debs kind of category, um, and it comes out the way it comes out, right? So that's it would you know as do Shank and Debs, right? They all come, they actually uphold the statutes, um, and so yeah, I think the key distinction that is um, that the court should talk about more that we're sort of dancing around is really speech neutral, non-speech neutral, rather than content neutral, non-content neutral. Um, you were worried, Eugene, about, um, about uh, uh, like noise levels and things, but you know, the noise level statute is really speech neutral. I mean, as long as the sort of car engine also can't be that loud, then it's not a prohibition that has on its face about speech at all. So you're still allowed to have rules like that. And um, Ash, you say, but surely we're not going to overturn 200 years of common law. But I say uh, the exact point here is that that's common law. That's not actually legislative. It's not actually Congress forbidding these things. So, and that the First Amendment is expressly about what Congress can do, what legislatures can do. So, um, so maybe some of these results are crazy, but you know, maybe actually not as crazy as they seem and actually surprisingly consistent with some of the doctrine. All right, thanks, Nick. Uh, one housekeeping matter that we need to take care of is uh, for those of you who want to get CLE uh, credit, there is a CLE password that you have to enter and it is up on the screen, but I will also read it, which is Now, I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative here, and even though I get to ask questions all day uh, to litigants, I never get to ask the question that I'm about to ask, which is, in the First Amendment context, and this is for anyone who wants to answer, answer are we really doing law here? And here's the reason why I say that. So as Nick said, there is a disconnect between the tiers of scrutiny and, and the way the court has, has interpreted the First Amendment. And then it seems to me, and many of you have brought this up, there's two value-laden steps in the First Amendment. One is what category are you in? Which tier are you in? So for example, commercial speech is put in what we think is intermediate scrutiny category because uh, it's less valuable speech. Um, so that's, that's, that's sort of the value-laden decision number one. How do we value the speech and how do we view it? And then number two, and I think Ash brought this up, which is when you get to compelling interest and you get to um, uh, rational base, et cetera, there's not a lot of rational basis in, in First Amendment, but when you get to that point, um, you're making a value-laden judgment about whether the interest that the government is trying to protect is really important enough to justify the restriction. And so are we really doing laws or some principled common law or, or textual basis for this? Or are we really, as judges and as courts, just making a series of value-laden decisions uh, along these steps? And I know that's a very loaded question, but I, I throw it out to you. 
Um, well, I'll, uh, uh, sorry, I, Judge, I'll just say, uh, uh, you know, of course I agree. And I think that's an indictment of this um, rubric. And I'll just suggest, you know, compare with the Fourth Amendment. So the First Amendment, I point out, restricts legislative action. The Fourth Amendment doesn't. It restricts executive action. And it's expressly invites judges to balance in just that way, right? Unreasonable searches and seizures. So uh, is a search at 3 p.m. more reasonable than a search at 3 a.m.? That's the judge gets to say yes. And searching, you know, is the government interest in searching for a, uh, you know, single marijuana joint as great as the government interest in searching for a nuclear bomb, sort of clearly not. But that's just the, the sort of costs and benefits of whether a search is reasonable or unreasonable. That's the Fourth Amendment text invites you to do that balancing. And the First Amendment uh, clearly doesn't. The text of it is distinctly in contrast to that Fourth Amendment invitation to balance. Others, Genevieve, I think you're, you're, you're anxious to give a response too. Well, I just, I did think it was interesting, the opposition between value judgments and law. I think law inevitably involves value judgments. It does. I, I presume that the question was, why is it up to the judges to uh, engage in these value judgments rather than the legislators or the constitutional drafters? Um, and I think it's, it's, you're absolutely right that the modern First Amendment doctrine requires judges to be making value judgments all the time. And we could get away from that, but I think that means going back to the 18th and 19th century model, which is a majoritarian First Amendment rather than a counter-majoritarian First Amendment. And But that doesn't just, by the way, that doesn't get out of the problem of value judging because what we look at, what we see when we look at the 18th and 19th century experience is juries making those judgments in lieu of judges because under the um, sort of common law practices in speech cases, libel cases, um, um, a blasphemy cases, what have you, it's the jury that gets to decide whether the speech is actually causing harm to the order or not. And so we're just moving it to a different um, agent. And also, by the way, we're getting much less speech protective doctrine. So we could, I think we could have a much more coherent and consistent First Amendment doctrine. But as I said in my remarks, it would be a much, 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 much weaker First Amendment. And so are we willing to go back to what Holmes and Brandeis rejected? Anyone else? All right, if not, we will move on to questions from the audience. So please raise your hand if you have questions. Um, and a warning ahead of time, please unmute your line um, if, if, one, if I call on you. And again, I'm just gonna repeat this. They asked me to repeat it a couple of times. The CLE password is um, I'm going to go ahead and call on Adam Griffin for the first question. And the one thing I will say is keep your questions short. We only have about 12 minutes left. So please, please keep your questions as short as possible. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Judge Strauss. And thank you to the panelists for a great panel. Uh, my question is uh, really for Professor Rosencrantz, but anybody um, can also answer. So I was wondering if Professor Rosencrantz, if you're saying that there could be no as applied First Amendment violations, that everything would have to be facial and that the executive cannot violate the First Amendment. Um, so if, an ex if the executive executes in a, the law in a way that Congress could not facially legislate, that would not violate the First Amendment in your view. Um, thank you all again. Thanks. Those are great questions. Uh, yes, it does imply that there's no such thing as an as applied, that there should be no such thing as an as applied challenge under the First Amendment. And, you know, that's really what follows from uh, from O'Brien. So which, you know, is suggesting a, uh, you know, balancing test for speech neutral laws and, uh, you know, a place in this um, uh, in this uh, tiers of scrutiny rubric, but the truth is the statute always wins. The statute always wins in, under that kind of analysis and it sort of always should um, for the same reason at uh, the same reason that um, that uh, um, the same reason that uh, religion neutral laws survive employment division v uh, Smith. So yes, it does um, suggest that. 
Um, and does it suggest that there'd be no challenges to executive action under the First Amendment? Yeah, sure does suggest that too. It says Congress shall make no law, so it doesn't forbid what the executive branch uh, does. And that may sound radical and alarming, but I want to suggest that it's not as radical as it may seem. Just as an example, we actually do put up with um, the, the president doesn't have that much freestanding power to restrict speech, but to the extent he has freestanding power in, for example, the military context as commander in chief, we actually do put up with all kinds of speech restrictions uh, that the president imposes on the troops, for example. Um, and uh, you asked the final part of your question in a quite a pointed way. What if the executive were to enforce it in a way that the legislature couldn't have legislated it? Um, and uh, there might well be a problem with that, but the problem wouldn't be a First Amendment problem. It would be a take care clause problem. So if the Congress passes a speech neutral law and the executive, for example, enforces it only against people who, you know, criticize his, you know, criticize his policies or something, um, that sure might be a constitutional violation, but it would be a violation of the take care clause, not a violation of the First Amendment. All right, and unless anyone else has a, wants to respond, we'll move on to our next question, uh, which is Maritza Bolano. And again, remember to please uh, unmute your mic. Go ahead. Maritza? All right, we'll have to move on. Uh, our next question comes, and, and I hope I can get this, uh, this name right, Franciszek Longchamps. And again, re please remember to unmute your mic. Um, and do you have a question for the panelists? Thank you very much. Thank you for the conference. I, I, uh, I attend this from, from Poland, uh, where I teach in Krakow, uh, freedom of speech and freedom of religion. And uh, we use also American examples uh, there is a case mentioned today that is read the town of Gilbert. And I have problems with explaining this case to my students, where you have nine to zero case that seems to be uh, very difficult uh, because it seems obvious to the Supreme Court, the result, even we have uh, concurrence here, uh, very strong concurrence here, but uh, reading an understanding of the statue of, of the town of Gilbert from Arizona, in Arizona, is completely different by by district court, the federal district court, and, and the Ninth Circuit. Then, then obviously different for for Supreme Court uh, as as content based and not content neutral. So we we basically imagine that Supreme Court is rather more political than lower courts. But in this situation, it seems that more political in thinking about the local policy and signpost uh, regulations uh, is uh, is the Court of Appeals. Do you, do you share this opinion? I'm, I'm happy to take a shot at that. Um, I, as you, as I think you know, I said I find the breed card case incomprehensible. I think it's important to recognize that the case I think was fairly poorly litigated by this council for the city. Um, the lower court conclusion that the law was content neutral was not really convincing at all. It was stretching doctrine in all sorts of ways. And th there were reasons why they, was, they could have gone in that direction, but it did not make a whole lot of sense. The Supreme Court's conclusion that the law was content-based, I think was correct. My problem is with the conclusion that then therefore it is inevitably unconstitutional, um, which kind of reiterates what I'm saying. I don't, if the city lawyers had forthrightly argued, as I think they should have, that the reason we're preferring political speech over non-political speech is because it's more important to democracy. It would have been interesting to see what the court would have said in response to that, but they never made that argument. So if I could uh, just chime in, because I think sure. this is something I do disagree with, uh, with Ash on uh, in part. Um, I think that this is part of, a, let's say 1948 to 2010, so basically 70 year pattern of the court declining to say that political speech is super protected above other kinds of speech. So I say 1948 because there's a case called Winters v. New York in 1948, uh, which involved a ban on uh, certain, I think they, they were uh, like detective stories that, that 
depicted tawdry things in life, depicted sex and violence and uh, uh, all about crime, a lot about sex crimes, and under state law that was, that was illegal. And the, and the government's defense is that we're not talking about political advocacy, we're just talking about nasty entertainment. And the court said entertainment is just as protected. Uh, in part because it is, uh, uh, it's very hard to draw the line between entertainment and political speech because we all know of entertainment that sends a political message. So since then, while the court has often said that political speech is on the highest rung of First Amendment protection, those are some wide wrongs. The court has made clear that other kinds of speech, not all, not false statements of fact perhaps, not commercial speech, but scientific speech, religious speech, by the way, read involved religious speech, um, uh, 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 social commentary, artistic speech, and the like are also fully protected. And the rationale was that once you let the government draw the line, even if it says, oh, we're making political speech super protected, that will justify its uh, making other kinds of speech less protected. And one of the strongest protections for various kinds of speech in the First Amendment context is the sense of required equal treatment, equal treatment of viewpoints, uh, especially strongly, but even equal treatment of subject matters, at least within this category of fully protected speech. So maybe that's a mistake when it comes to sign ordinances. Maybe you might say as to signs, there's just such a danger that if we allow it all, there's going to be all this clutter, there's going to be all this interference, uh, uh, sorry, clutter, all this interference with traffic, that that's bad. And you need to have, uh, at least allow the court to distinguish political speech from, in this case, just describing events such as uh, uh, such as religious uh, gatherings. But that's something that the court for a long time has been quite reluctant to do, and I think with good reason. Can I chime in and give hey, my- Anyone best, else? Yeah, sure. can I give my best account of why it was 9-0 and read? Because um, I think that the concurrence by Justice Kagan is the best account of what's going on, um, and I don't really like the majority opinion. Okay, so I think the way to understand read is that there's a fight going on about what counts as content neutral, what counts as content-based speech regulations? Is it going to be a facial test where anytime there's a content category on the face of the statute, we're going to treat it as content-based and apply strict scrutiny? Or is it going to be, as the Supreme Court and lower courts had held in many cases for many years up until that point, that we're going to look at whether the government is the purposes that the government is regulating the speech? Do, do the purposes have something to do with preventing, with, with a concern about the harmful effect of the message, or are they completely irrelevant to that? And so that's going to determine the tier of scrutiny. And what Justice Kagan says in her concurring opinion in Reed is that, look, we may, we may think that this is a content neutral regulation of speech. There's a big caveat here, but at least on its face, this looks like a content neutral regulation of speech because for all the reasons Eugene uh, just mentioned, there's lots of reasons to regulate signs that have nothing to do with the dislike of the content. But even if we apply the uh, relatively deferential intermediate scrutiny that we apply to content regulations of speech, the town of Gilbert has really no justifications for the way it's sing singling out religious messages or church messages by imposing really onerous restrictions and when they can put up signs and when they can put down signs that don't apply to other kinds of speech. And that raises all kinds of concerns that actually what's going on here is some kind of religious discrimination. And I will just say, I think it's interesting that this didn't appear more in the opinion by the Supreme Court. But if you look at the history of the enactment of the ordinance, it looks very suspicious. I mean, originally it just applied to churches. And then the, the, I think the town of Gilbert recognizes that this is problematic and so it broadens it and obscures what it's doing. But I think there's a lot of anti-religious animus against this church uh, behind the ordinance. And so Hagen says, even if we treat this as content neutral, this is still terrible because um, as I noted earlier, there's lots of reasons to think even when the government is regulating in a content neutral fashion, its effects might be bad or it might actually be using content neutrality as a pretext and being and be uh, trying to target particular speakers. And so on that basis, I think the holding and read is absolutely correct. The municipalities should not be able to use content neutral sign laws to hound particular churches and to prevent them from publicizing their messages. But the majority goes further than that. And it says, because this uh, sign law makes a subject matter distinction between religious and non-religious uh, speech, it, strict scrutiny automatically applies. And although I agree completely that the viewpoint distinctions have for many decades not been treated as basically categorically forbidden, except in particular categories like professional speech um, and other categories. But when, when we're talking about public speech, viewpoint discrimination is very uh, problematic. Subject matter distinctions had never had that same disfavored um, status. And so the difficulty, what Reed, why Reed is a difficult case is the majority opinion seems to equate 
uh, law that makes subject matter distinctions to law that make viewpoint distinctions when there's actually no necessity to do so to reach the correct holding in the case. I'll stop there. All right. Well, that's going to have to be our last question um, because we are we're butting up. In fact, it just turned 1115. But I would really like to thank the panelists and all of you uh, for joining us today. Um, I, just a reminder here that the next convention event, which is a discussion on the freedom of association in the legal profession, will begin in 15 minutes, 1230 Eastern time. And again, thank you very much for joining us. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the convention. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Judge.